In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This is February 7th, Feast of St. Romuald, who was the abbot and founder of the Order of Monks. called the Camel the Camel Dolly Camel Dolens order of monks so they were uh, they followed the rule of St. Benedict but it was a more uh, austere rule following of the rule before I begin I just want to remind you I just returned from the mass circuits in England and in Ireland. And we had um, the chance to visit the tomb of St. Patrick. Under that big tomb is also St. Bridget and St. Columban. And then we also, the same day, um, went south, north of Dublin, about half an hour, is the city of Drogheda, where in the 1600s, Oliver Cromwell slaughtered the whole city with his soldiers because they, the English had better weapons, they had better, they had gunpowder, the Irish didn't have all these things. So they just slaughtered the whole city. And they did this throughout a lot of the eastern side of Ireland to crush the Catholic faith out of Ireland. And uh, Cromwell ridiculed the Catholic faith and mocked the Irish for their praying their rosaries. So uh, many years later, in the 1600s as well, was at the end of the Great Persecutions, was the last saint to be killed at the Tyburn tree in 1681, which was St. Oliver Plunkett, who was Bishop of Armagh. And he was a very zealous and good bishop. He, during the persecutions, he would say mass in people's homes. He would travel on foot. He would go from village to village, confirming, giving confirmation ordaining priests as well, who were prepared in secret in their studies. Um, they had to often go into hiding. So he was zealous for the conversion of Ireland and took care of the souls. St. Oliver Plunkett was finally arrested and brought to England across the Channel and taken to the London Tower. There he was sentenced to death, and he would be executed, hang drawn and quartered at the Tyburn tree. His head is in the Church of St. Peter in Droida. You can see his incorrupt head. It's, his skin is darkened from years of candles, and his eyeballs are sunken in. But nevertheless, you see his, his skull and his, his features, the shape of his face, and uh, part of his neck sticking out because it was cut off. So, and uh, not far from there is also the door where, which was kept, the door that kept him in prison, and that's kept as a relic as well. Also, some other bones of his are on display as relics. So that was in Droida, and then in Dublin, we were hoping to visit the tomb of Father Dennis Fay. He's buried there. And Nula, the old lady who fights for the faith in Ireland, she said that they removed something about his tomb, and they, they confused it deliberately. And took off a crucifix that marked his tomb. So the modernists, do not, the, the modernists, Holy Ghost Fathers are ashamed of Father Dennis Fahey. So, but we didn't get a chance to see his tomb. 
And, uh, and then we also saw an old monastery built in the 1100s, Kilkuli, which I've seen before. And, and there's the old altar in there and some tombs of knights. And the old monastery in part ruins. And you can still, still see the structure of the monastery, that it was built with uh, huge cloisters and they had channels, irrigation of water. The channels that the monks built still flow with water. And you can still see the fields and the wall that they built. It was a seven mile wall that surrounds the whole monastery property. And not just a four foot wall. It is probably 13 to 14 feet high and four or five feet thick laid with rock and cement by these monks in the 10 hundreds and the wall is unshakable it's it's power, powerfully built so quite impressive to see and, and then uh, we went on to the west side of Ireland and saw Crow Patrick, where the mountain that Crow Patrick climbed and spent 40 days. We weren't able to climb it because the weather was very severe. It was all shrouded in clouds and rain and high winds. So some people are said to die up there from hypothermia if they get caught. So we'll have to do that another day. And um, also on the west side, we saw the shrine of Our Lady of Knock. Just a short, quick visit. It turns out on that same day, this infamous priest, Father J James Martin, was meeting with the bishops of Ireland at Knock to tell them how to do the blessings for these pervert couples. So, had I known... Had we known where they were having their conference, <laughs> they would have had a, a reminder of their duties. But nevertheless, we went to the shrine. And what's interesting about Our Lady of Knock is Our Lady appears not inside the church. It's a beautiful ancient church, not too huge, but she appears outside the church in the back of it. And she appears with St. John, who's holding the book of the Apocalypse and an eagle. And St. Joseph is bowing to Our Lady. And then, and then right in the very center of the back of the church is an altar with a lamb and a cross. And Our Lady says there's no message from her appearance at Knock. There's no words. So the British have a joke, well, the Irish talk so much, so Our Lady was t teaching the Irish to uh, stop talking so much. But I don't think that's the message. She didn't say a word. It was just a vision. And it was children were the first to see. And then the appearance of Our Lady and St. John and St. Joseph and the Lamb and the altar appeared there for... I think it was a span of five or seven hours. So the people of the village started gathering and witnessing this appearance. And they started falling on their knees and repenting of their sins and praying the rosary and so forth. So what is the message of Nock? What is the message? Well, there's been many guesses and many People who have tried to discern what's the true meaning. Perhaps it is this. I don't say this is the final say. Mother Church is, gives the final interpretation of it when she recovers her tradition. But very possibly, Our Lady is warning. One, St. John is there and he's holding the book of the Apocalypse open. That perhaps that she's giving the indication. This, this happened shortly after La Salette. So about 10 or 15 years after Our Lady of La Salette in 1864. So perhaps the message is that St. John is there holding the apocalypse to tell us that we're entering into that age of the apocalyptic visions. 
and among them preeminently is the dragon that rises up to sweep a third of the stars into hell, that's a third of the bishops, who lose the faith. The sun is eclipsed, the loss of the faith. But the woman, and in the Apocalypse chapter 12, the woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and the role of Our Lady to rescue the church and bring in her age of Mary. So it's very possible that was the message of Our Lady, that we're entering into this apocalyptic age. And Archbishop Lefebvre says, said that explicitly in one of his sermons in the 80s. This is an apocalyptic era, fulfilling many prophecies, especially the loss of faith. And then the, the appearance is outside the church with an altar in the Lamb. Again, it's possibly pointing to the time that's going to come within a hundred years when you can't go to the churches for Mass because there will be a, a, an empty new Mass, a Protestant service, and our Lord won't be found there. But he'll be found outside the church at altars, not in the church. That is, altars in homes, altars in hotel rooms, garages, barns, hotel conferences, halls. And that's where we are, that's what we're doing today. And and then St. Joseph, of course, is is doesn't say a word. Of course, there's not a word of his in Scripture. So he keeps his tradition, but he's bowing to Our Lady. And he also appeared at Fatima, holding the child Jesus, and the child Jesus blessing the whole world. So the role of St. Joseph, protector of the church. And Our Lady stands as the Immaculate Conception. So this vision of Nock is very profound, very deep, and... There's no word spoken, but it says a lot. And we can learn from it to have a great devotion to Our Lady, the Immaculate Conception, to the Mass, and to fight for the Mass. They have the churches, we have the faith, and we're living that today. And then to have a great devotion to St. Joseph. And then um, we made our way back to Belfast, the northern part of Ireland, is still very Protestant and under English, directly English rule. St. Patrick foresaw in a vision that the North Ireland would be split in half and the northern side would fall to heresy. And then we went back to England for uh, some more of the mass circuits and I flew back on Monday. So pray for these uh, fighting faithful in England and Ireland. Pray for them all. And pray for Bishop Williamson, who's there. Pray for Bishop Bellini, who's in Ireland. And he's assisted by Father Ortolano, who was ordained about a year ago. And Father Ortolano is an American boy. So is another priest there, Father Hoops. So pray uh, for them, all of them. And let's look briefly at the life of St. Romuald. St. Romuald, son of a nobleman, Sergius, his father, whose name was Sergius, born at Ravenna in Italy, while a youth withdrew to the nearby monastery of Classis to do penance. Why? Because his father had a huge fight with another Italian, and they decided to settle it with a duel. And this is the 900s, so... St. Romeo will die in 1027, so, and he was born in 956, so there's no gunpowder at this time. So it was a duel of swords, which is a painful death to be cut up. You basically bleed inside. So Sergius, his father, demanded young Romuald, the boy, who at this time was a teenage boy, to witness the duel. And he did out of obedience to his father, but he didn't like to be there. And it so moved him to see his father kill this man. He was so, he felt so guilty because he, he was there as a witness. That's why he went to this monastery. And he, they say he wept continually and did much penance for this. There, the discourse of a monk 
strongly stirred his love of piety. So one of the monks became kind of his guardian angel and was talking to him about the shortness of life and how we should be prepared for death and how he saw a man die and bleed to death and how our life here is preparing for death and that we must live for heaven and renounce this world and live virtuous and in the state of grace and keep the commandments. And this good brother talking to him many times in the day stirred in him a great love of God. And he, of course, he saw the example of all the monks living their life of prayer and penance and hard work. So he was stirred and having twice seen blessed Apollinaris in a vision at night in the church, he became a monk himself, as the servant of God had predicted. Later on, he went to Marinus, who lived in the neighborhood of Venice, a man famous at that time for a holy life and strict austerity, that under such a master and guide he might follow the narrow path of high perfection. Assailed by the snares of Satan, and the hatred of men, he strove all the more to humble himself constantly with fasting and prayer, and he enjoyed meditating on heavenly things, shedding abundant tears. And he was invited to lead a monastery by some monks, and what, what happened to him was very similar to what happened to St. Benedict. The monks, some of them planned to kill him. Here it is, a holy monastery, men living for perfection, <laughs> And you find them, some of them can be very wicked. And one of them plotted, a couple of them plotted his death. And he became aware of it, and he just left the monastery, like St. Benedict. Such was the joy which ever beamed on his face, that it made all who looked on him cheerful. Princes and kings held him in great honor, and at his advice many left the world and entered the monastery or convent seeking solitude. A desire for martyrdom also inflamed him and induced him to set out for Pannonia, but a malady which tormented him as often as he set out and left him when he turned back obliged him to return. He illustrious for many miracles during his life and likewise after his death. He was also endowed with the gift of prophecy like the patriarch Jacob, he saw in a vision a ladder that reached from heaven to earth, on which men in white robes ascended and descended. He interpreted this miraculous vision as signifying the Kamal Doli's monks, of whom he was the founder. At length, having reached the age of 120, and after having served God by a life of most austere penance for a hundred years, he went to his reward in the year of salvation, 1027. His body was found incorrupt five years after it had been buried and was then placed with due honor in the church of his order at Fabriano in Italy. Some of the words he used to say, he went out at one point of his life, he, he prayed in the, in, in the wilderness found a cave, and he was very tempted by the devil to strong temptations to despair. And, and then one time, through his continuous weeping, he thought others had a like gift, and he often said to his monks, do not weep too much, for it prejudices the sight and gives you a headache. It was his desire, whenever he could, conveniently avoid it, not to say Mass before a number of people, because he could not refrain from tears in offering the august sacrifice of the Mass. The contemplation of the divinity often transported him out of himself, melting in tears and burning with love. He would cry out, Dear Jesus, my dear Jesus, my unspeakable desire, my joy, joy of the angels, sweetness of the saints and the like. And then, he was known also for his severe penances, often to be admired, but not always imitated. And he 
He died in the monastery in the valley of Castro in the Marquisate of Ancona as he was born about the year 956. He must have died 70 years and some months old, not 120 at the present copies of his life have it. The day of his death was on the 19th of June, but his principal feast is appointed by Clement the Seventh on the 7th of February today. His body was found entirely in incorrupt five years after his death and again in 1466. And his tomb being sacrilegiously opened and his body stolen in 1480, it fell to dust, in which state it was translated to Fabriano and there deposited in the great church. All but the remains of one arm sent to Camoldoli. God had honored his relics with many miracles, the Order of Camaldoli is now divided into five congregations. Of course, Vatican II finished them off. So that, I don't think there's any of his monks left. And there's many religious orders that completely disappeared after Vatican II. So anyway, let's pray to St. Robert for the great love of the Mass that he had, the great love of God, the great love for souls. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to Thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to Thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to Thee. And for those who do not have recourse to Thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.